Good evening and welcome to a new live series. Maybe in the summer you saw something which, though you didn't know it at the time, might now help to solve a major criminal investigation. Our last programme before the break produced some remarkable results, which more later. Right now, once again, detectives are gathered here waiting for your call. And there are BBC researchers on hand if you prefer to speak to one of them. Here's a the number which you'll see throughout the programme, 081 811 8181. And for hard of hearing viewers, the Minicom number, 081 743 2468. There's brand new evidence to consider in each of our three reconstructions tonight. Seven year old Angela Flaherty was murdered four weeks ago near her home in Huddersfield. Police now have clear fingerprints from her bicycle. Perhaps you can help trace the person they belong to. In the investigation into the murder of Mrs Penny Bell from Denham in Buckinghamshire, a new witness reports seeing a man getting into her blue Jaguar less than an hour before she was murdered. And police investigating the kidnap and murder of 18-year-old Julie Dart from Leeds reveal new clues contained in letters they've received from the killer. Two weeks ago at Oxford Crown Court, two men pleaded guilty to charges of armed robbery. Shots had been fired into the cab of a security van. You may remember the crime watch reconstruction. The attack was foiled because so many members of the public ran up to intervene. That smashing of the window led directly to the arrests. A crime watch viewer phoned to say he'd replaced glass on a car like that and he had the registration number. It turned out to be a hire car and police traced details of the man who'd rented it. Two robbers received a total of 14 years imprisonment. And thank you to more than 600 people who called, offering help in the effort to trace 21-year-old Joe Ramsden, who has Down syndrome. There was a lot of information for police to work through, including many suggestions on the identity of the man with the patterned jumper seen crossing the road with Joe in Bridport on the afternoon she disappeared. The incident room is still open, of course, so if you think you can help, it's not too late to ring us. Once again, we're on 081 811 8181. Few crimes arouse such feelings of revulsion as the killing of a child. One Sunday lunchtime in early August, the body of a seven-year-old, Angela Flaherty, was discovered in a play den in a copse close to her home in Huddersfield. The police have launched a huge inquiry, and though they think it's likely the killer is a local man, potential witnesses to the events that day might come from anywhere in Britain. There are sightings of two men, either of whom could be the killer, and detectives on the case, as well as Angela's family, hope you might be able to tell us who those people are. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're now three and a half weeks into this murder inquiry, and I think it's perhaps about time that we had a look at the facts that we know them to be at this moment in time. Angela Lee Anflate was seven years of age. She was the youngest of four sisters, came from a good family, and she lived with her family in Brownroyd Avenue on the Rawthorpe Estate. Rawthorpe overlooks Kellner Bank, where children often played in a den among the trees, and where Angela was found. Just below the copse, there's a lane called Bradley Mills Road, which runs down to Huddersfield Town football ground. The afternoon she died, some 2,000 people were gathered here from across the west of Yorkshire. Huddersfield were playing Leeds United. So what do we know about Angela's movements on Saturday the 10th of August? We know that during the morning, she was home watching television <coughs> with the sisters. And then she went outside playing with a pink and white pedal cycle. From after lunch till roughly three o'clock, Angela was with her sister and some friends in the play area behind her home. At three, she was seen with a friend not far away at Rawthorpe Infant School. Can we come up? No, you're too little. I'll call the caretaker. He's gone home. Come on, Michael. From then on, it's not clear what Angela was up to until five o'clock when she was back in the play area. Sometime before 5.30, she pedalled off behind some houses above the slope of Kellner Bank. She wasn't seen alive by her family again. 
Around 10 to 6, Susan Duncan was driving home from the market where each Saturday she sells clothes. Her route brought her right behind the cops as she made her way up Bradley Mills Road. When he landed, he lost his balance practically and he started running up the hill hell for leather as if somebody was after him. He looked about age 16. He had fair complexion. He was of medium height and wore all beige clothing and his T-shirt wasn't of the baggy type. It was close-fitting uh, and I could see his waist quite clearly, which in my opinion looked to be 28 to 30 inches. He was extremely slim. This man may have been there for some very innocent reason, but he could be our killer. It is vitally important that we trace this youth and interview him. Sometime before eight, more than two hours after Angela had cycled off, Tom Smith and his sister Kate were driving down the hill behind the cops. I saw him stood looking back into the woods where he just jumped from. I just thought it was funny. He's black hair, medium weight, um, blue jeans and a grey white coat with a blue stripe down the arm. What we are wanting to do is desperately trace those two unidentified men. We must press on with our inquiries in the Rawthorpe estate and on the estate at the bottom of Kilnabank. There are 692 houses on Rawthorpe estate alone. Every person over the age of five has to be interviewed and over 80 officers have been drafted in to help. Did you know Angela Flatterson? Yes, I did. Could you tell me the time and place you last saw Angela? Around about quarter past five Saturday afternoon. And that was on the 10th of August? Yes. Did you know Angela? Yes, I did. And how did you know Angela? Uh, my son Michael uh, used to play with her. Have you ever visited a den on Kilner Bank? Uh, only when Michael took me down there. Did you see any girl answering Angela's description on Saturday the 10th? Every male over the age of 10 who lives in the community is being asked to account for his movements on the day of the murder. Each story then has to be verified carefully. Detectives strongly suspect the killer will turn out to come from Angela's own neighbourhood. The reason I believe that the killer is going to be a local man is due to statistical research and the many inquiries of this nature it has been found that the man has been a local. I've also got to bear in mind, of course, the scene where Angela's body was found. It was in a copse, in a den which was used by local children, and it's obviously very important to believe that the man must have known about that den. If Crime Watch viewers lead police to individual suspects, then forensic evidence is likely to convict them or eliminate them from the inquiry. Angela's bike was found close to the body and it's been subjected to minute examination. A single fibre has been found, which could come from the attacker's clothing. Some new high-tech analysis is being done to gather microscopic clues, but plain old-fashioned fingerprinting could still provide the crucial incriminating links. We have now taken fingerprints from Angela's friends, Angela's family, and any person that we can find who had legitimate access to that particular bicycle. Some of the prints have been identified as coming from Angela's friends and family. However, there are still other as yet unidentified prints. And I'm very hopeful that these are in fact the marks left by her killer. Peter Baltimore, there's no doubt how best Crime Watch viewers can help, and that's identifying the two men seen at the bottom of Kilner Bank, jumping into the road. The first one, seen by Susan Davis, at about uh, 10 to 6. Tell us what we know about him, how viewers might recognise him. This man is 16 to the early 20s, is 5 foot 8, is slim build, he's got collar-length brown hair, 
and he was wearing light-coloured casual clothing and running away from the scene at a very, very fast speed. Now, and although Susan Duncan said he was about 16, a second witness thought uh, he was older. That's correct, yes. And the second chap who was seen by Tom and Kate Smith, this is a couple of hours later, about quarter to eight. Tell we still haven't him. found him. He is in his 20s, 5'10", collar length, dark hair, and was wearing blue denim jeans and a, a grey jacket. Now, it's possible that either or both of these men were there for perfectly innocent reasons. Nothing to do with this inquiry, nothing to do with Angela at all. That, that is true, or they may have been there for some other reason that they're frightened of coming forward. I am looking for one person and one person on her, and that is Angela's killer. If those people are watching television tonight, I don't care what other reason they were there for, please ring me and we will deal with that matter in confidence. OK, that's a, a good promise. What about people who are watching who have suspicions? I mean, must it be someone who comes from Huddersfield or could it be someone with Huddersfield connections? I'm interested in anyone who was in Huddersfield in the Rothorpe Dalton area on that Saturday afternoon. Saturday, Saturday the 10th evening, of August. The 10th of August, wherever they come from within the country. And I'm wanting people, really, who have any information at all to ring in, not to presume that someone else may ring in. Please ring in because we've got to catch this killer of this beautiful and innocent little girl before another tragedy occurs. OK, well, please, if uh, this does not result in arrest, don't find yourself saying, oh, I always had suspicions about that. Please call us now with any suspicions you have or if you can identify either of those two men. Here's the number, 081 811 8181. 081 811 8181 or you can call the incident room in Huddersfield that's 0484 436621 0484 the code for Huddersfield 436621 well, more news from previous programmes now. In each of two recent rape inquiries, the victim courageously worked with the Crime Watch team in making the film. And in both cases now, a man has been arrested as a direct result of calls from viewers. On one case, in May, we reported on the rape of a Scottish woman in Peterborough, and a man is now in custody awaiting trial. In the other case, last October, a 17-year-old girl was abducted in Ealing and raped by a man who had a Londonderry accent and was driving a distinctive red Cortina car. Do you want a cigarette? Thanks. John! Well, while the programme was on the air, a viewer contacted us, giving detectives an address where that car would be found. We also received a call from another woman who'd been attacked by the same man. Last month, a man was found guilty at St Albans Crown Court on two counts of rape and one of abduction. He received a sentence of seven years for each rape and three years for abduction to run concurrently. Another viewer rang with an address for a man detectives had appealed for on photo call in connection with a serious assault. Police called at a house in Wakefield just after Crime Watch update had come off the air and a man has now been charged with rape. And a viewer put a name to another photo call face. A building society robber in West London has now been arrested and charged with robberies in London and East Anglia. Well, let's see if we can have as much success with this month's photo call to take us through the faces of Detective Constable Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher. The International and Organised Crime Branch at New Scotland Yard need your help to find William and Christopher Schaefer. They wish to discuss the importation of 90 tonnes of cannabis into the United States from Southeast Asia. We know the brothers enjoy the good life, staying in top-class hotels when they visit England, Belgium and Holland. William Schaefer is 45, 6 foot, and has been known to call himself Bill Rains. Christopher Schaefer is 42, also about 6 foot, and uses the names Edward Knightley, Chris Roberts and Chris Kesner. The Drugs Enforcement Agency in the States are offering a substantial reward, so if you know where they are, ring us now. Next, can you tell us who this odd couple are? Be odd because of such a gap in their ages. This is the Chelsea Building Society, Exeter, where the younger man threatened staff with a gun. A week later, they made a similar attack on another building society, this time 170 miles east in Brighton. Here, the older man tried to hide, using a hanky in front of his face. The younger man is between 25 and 35, around 5 foot 11, with pointed features. The older one is between 50 and 60, about 5 foot 7, and has a weather-beaten complexion. And both times wore silver-rimmed glasses and a dark blazer. If you know them, please call tonight. This man calls himself Bob Trevelyan, or Brian Freeman, or Barrington Auger, or you may know him as just Cornish Bob. We need to speak to him about serious sexual offences, including the rape of a young woman. 
This home video was taken at Christmas. We know that up until May this year, he was living on a houseboat on the Grand Union Canal in Brentford, Middlesex. But where is he now? He's 51, five foot eight with graying brown hair. He's an outgoing character who enjoys a drink and may look for work at boat yards. If you've come across him or know where he is now, then please call us. Finally, can you help us identify two men? It was on a Monday night in July when security cameras caught them strolling into a factory in Hertfordshire. Staff at Crossfield Electronics Hemel Hempstead arrived at work the next day to discover seven of their computers worth over £40,000 had been unplugged and taken. We'd like to talk to two of these two men as they might be able to help us. The first man is in his mid-twenties and has a Middle Eastern appearance. The second man is about the same age. He has longer hair and tattoos on both of his upper arms. If you think you know them or any of our other photocall faces, please call us tonight. And there's the number 081 811 8181. If there's anyone you think you recognise, 081 811 8181. The murder of Penny Bell earlier this summer made national news headlines. Now three months on, the motive for her death remains a mystery. By all accounts, she was a woman who had everything. A happy family life with her husband and two children, a large, comfortable home in Buckinghamshire, and a successful business career running the employment agency she had helped to set up. But on the morning of Thursday, June the 6th, she was found dead in her blue Jaguar outside a West London swimming pool. Actors take the parts of the family in our reconstruction, but her husband, Alistair himself, begins our film at the family's home in Denham. Penny was a vivacious woman. She laughed a lot. She had a great sense of humour. She had a lot of personality, and she was very open, outgoing, gregarious, far more so than myself, perhaps. I miss every aspect of our life together. The only way I can describe it is that she was the other half of my personal jigsaw. And to lose that is to lose everything, basically. And uh, the reason for my life now is the children. Hi. Hi. Penny usually arrived home from work at about six o'clock. Oh, Two days before her murder, a family friend, Victoria Bird, had been looking after nine-year-old Lauren. Oh, I was really looking forward to that. I'd be glad when those builders are finished. Oh, I know. Dear, the mess, isn't it? Don't touch that line, there's lots of money in there. So what sort of day did you have today? On the previous Monday, June the 3rd, Penny had withdrawn eight and a half thousand pounds from her bank. She'd never before taken out such a large amount of cash. The day of Penny's death, Thursday, June the 6th, began as usual. Bye, Mo. Bye, Mum. Bye, darling. Bye, bye, darling. See you tonight. I left the house at 8.30 with our son, Matthew, for me to go to the office and to drop him off on the way. We would always wave each other off, whoever was leaving. So Penny would always stand at the entrance to wave goodbye. On that particular morning, she didn't. But then the house was buzzing with people and there were lots and lots of things going on. It does leave a very strange feeling to kiss your wife goodbye at the door and say that you're going to see her again at 6.30 and, of course, never to see her again. Donald, have you got anything to sort out with Penny? Yes, Penny, I've got, I've got to sort out the detail of the electrical wiring in the kitchen. Well, you'll have to be quick because um, I've got an appointment at 10 to 10 and I really don't want to miss it. Well, I really need to know the fine detail because I've got, I've got to get the tile line and various things. Can't you ring the kitchen designers? Yes, I could do. That's the best thing. OK, then. that's what I'll do. I thought you'd be able to do the wardrobes in the bedroom for better price and would be quality. Yeah. Well, OK, so. this is what I want. Right. It's so that the wood mm -hmm. matches the cream of that wallpaper. Right, OK. Well, this is sycamore. Yeah. Um, and we could use white ash, which would be the same colour, but it'd be a bit cheaper. Oh, fine. Yeah. Good. Should we go up and have a look? Yeah. Right. OK, but it must be quick. Taking the wallpaper and woodblock samples with her, Penny left home at about 20 to 10. Cheerio, I'm off now. If there's any problems, get Dave to ring me in the office. This is Black Park in Ivor, a five-minute drive from Penny's house. And at just about a quarter to ten, a woman walking her dog remembers seeing a man waiting in a bronze or brown-coloured car in a lay-by on Fulmer Common Road.
Penny's usual route to her office in Kilburn was along the A40. But it was in Greenford, shortly before half past ten, that a lorry driver saw a car like Penny's. Chris Lamport remembers a blonde woman driving very slowly along Greenford Road. There was a male passenger. She was looking as though she was trying to park the car, but the gentleman kept correcting her steering and kept making her carry on down the road. I presumed it was a new car for her, so she was learning how to cope with it. After a little while, it seemed safe for me to overtake, so I overtook. I saw a gentleman with his hand on the steering wheel and he was wearing a gold chain on his right wrist. A mile further up Ryslip Road East is Gurnell Swimming Pool. After half past ten, several people remember seeing Penny's Blue Jaguar in a secluded part of the car park. It's now less than an hour since Penny left home. As I walked past, I noticed the windscreen wipers and the lights were flashing on the car, which I thought was very odd because it was a nice sunny day. I didn't look in the car to see. I just kept walking. At about a quarter to 11, a man was seen leaving the car park. He looked unusually smart to be going swimming and wasn't carrying any kit. One side of his face seemed disfigured in some way. At about the same time, Patricia Parry, an auxiliary nurse, was turning into Ryslip Road East. There was a car I could see in the distance up Grinnell towards the swimming pool, really motoring it. And I thought, well, I'll get out before him, which I did. And as I was driving along the Ryslip Road, he was right up behind me. He flashed me, hooted me to get out of the way, and I never. I was angry because he was, he was just driving so fast. I thought, well, I'm not letting him pass. But I got a bit scared as he, you know, we came up here. I thought, oh, forget it, Pat, pull in. Penny's murder was discovered at 12 o'clock. She'd been repeatedly stabbed. The wallpaper sample was spread out on the center console of the car. Her handbag was behind the front passenger seat with her purse still in it, but missing and still unaccounted for is the eight and a half thousand pounds in cash. But in fact, Mr. Edwards, you don't really believe robbery was the motive? No, that's right. Although the eight and a half thousand pounds is still unaccounted for, and that's very significant, I don't think that robbery was the motive for her killing. In that case, do you think she knew her killer? Do you think there was a personal motive? I think, judging from the nature of the attack, it's very likely that Penny knew her killer, and that's why we've gone to such lengths to build up her lifestyle. Is there a side to Penny's life, then, that you don't know about, do you think? Well, we have a home video of Penny, in fact, which is a very good likeness of her. And from all our inquiries that we've been able to make, we know that she was happily married, a successful businesswoman, and to all intents and purposes, no motive whatsoever for killing her. So if anybody out there tonight does know more about mm. her, please do mm. ring us. That's right. Now, this is the wallpaper which was spread across the Jaguar's <coughs> central console when she was found. What do you think the significance of that was? Why do you think it was, was open there? Well, it was spread in such a way that she was either showing it to somebody or browsing through it, awaiting the arrival of somebody. We know that she had shown it to a carpenter that morning to get a second opinion on the colour match. And what we're asking ourselves is whether she had made arrangements to meet somebody else regarding the paper. Certainly we know that she told the builder she had an appointment at 10 to 10, <coughs> and that could very well have been the man that was seen in the lay-by at Fulmer Common Road. Yes, the timing is certainly consistent with that, and also the witness is fairly confident that the woman she saw was Penny. If it wasn't Penny, then we would like to hear from both of the drivers uh, for elimination purposes, obviously. What was the description of the man the witness saw? He was about 5 foot 10 tall, 48 years old, medium build, light shirt and dark trousers. The lorry driver's report of a woman and passenger in Greenford half an hour later also ties in time-wise, but what do you think was going on there? It's very difficult to say. One interpretation could be that the driver was in serious difficulty in trying to draw attention to himself, or the other could be that it was some sort of an argument over a parking space. We need to hear from anybody who can shed light on that sighting, really.
And you're sure that the murder actually took place at the swimming pool car park? Yes, that's the one thing that we can be sure of. And that being the case, we're very interested to hear from anybody who was in that car park between 9 and 12 who can tell us anything about that. Right. And indeed, uh, for elimination purposes, anybody, any female who may have been driving a blue Jaguar in that area early in June, please do ring us. In fact, if you think you can help at all, the number here in the studio is 081 811 8181, or you can phone right station on 0895 254 833. That's 0895, the code for Ricelip, 254 833. Calls coming in uh, quite heavily just at the moment. One of the surprises so far is that a number of them have been about Joe Ramsden, the 21-year-old with uh, Down syndrome who disappeared from Pool in Dorset much earlier this year. We just uh, gave a reminder and an update on that earlier on in this programme. Several addresses to be checked out from uh, Photocall and some places no doubt will be visited this evening. On the Angela Flaherty reconstruction, uh, several calls giving possible names and addresses uh, throughout the north of England, one actually quite, uh, quite far down to the south too. Well, thanks to viewers to our programme in June, I can report a result on an incident desk case. A man has been arrested for a series of violent sexual assaults on women in Birkenhead. He's now been charged with three counts of rape and two of indecent assault. Well, let's try and uh, do as well again tonight with some new appeals in brief. Here again are Jackie Hames and David Hatcher. On the 30th of July, an off-duty policeman witnessed an armed robbery on a secure corps van. It happened in St Leonard's Road, Northampton. The robbers drove off in this Golf GTI and as the officer tried to block their way, they shot at him. Luckily, he wasn't hurt. The two men were both dressed in sports gear. The younger man was between 20 and 25, about 5 foot 8 and a slim to medium build. The other man was between 30 and 40, 5 foot 10 to 6 foot and had a pot belly. So if you think you recognise these two, please call us now. Next, a fire in south-east London that led to a murder inquiry. This is a disused warehouse in Copeland Road, Peckham, and it's 11pm on August the 8th. After the fire brigade had put out the blaze, they discovered the body of a man who'd been beaten over the head before being doused with petrol. We think he's between 40 and 60 years old, 6 foot tall, had brown hair which was going grey and receding, and these distinctive whiskers. He also wore dentures. His dark suit had this handwritten mark on the trouser label, Fenton or Fento Gen Hoss. If it is a hospital, we can't find it. Maybe you know what it means. If you think you know anything that will help the murder team, ring us now. And if you know who this shopper is, you could help solve a robbery. At midnight on Sunday the 4th of August, the manager of a Thomas Cook Bureau de Change was hijacked at gunpoint outside his home in Ash near Margate, Kent. Two men forced him to drive over 100 miles to his office in New Haven and hand over £35,000. One of them may have been caught on camera in the village supermarket in Ash earlier in the day. And this is an e-fit of one of the hijackers. Pretty similar, isn't it? He's about 30, 5 foot 8 inches tall, and the other man called him Tun Up. This is the man who had the gun. He's about 6 foot tall, well built, and kept using the slang word Kushti. In fact, both men have London accents. If you think you recognise them, please call us. There's a £10,000 reward. Next, we need your help to identify this man. In June, he abducted and raped an 11-year-old girl from Corn near Leicester. He drove her around for over an hour before he left her in the Ashby Road area of Loughborough, three miles away. He's in his mid-thirties, five foot nine, with a slim face and fair hair. He had piercing blue eyes and a Scottish accent. His car is a white Mark III Ford Escort. It's a hatchback with grey and blue patterned seats and is about five to eight years old. That's an A to D registration. If you can place a man like that with that car, please call us now. On Sunday the 25th of August, the annual Notting Hill Carnival took place. About a million people went this year and, as usual, it went with a swing. But later that evening, something happened which marred what would otherwise have been a fairly trouble-free carnival. The murder of scientist Nick Hanscom. Nick had been at the carnival for most of the day, but just after 10 o'clock, like many other people, he was making his way home. Nick was stabbed by a group of men aged between 16 and 20 after being forced against a wall at the junction of Fernhead Road and Marbon Road. He died shortly afterwards. If you were in that area, you may have witnessed the attack without realising what was happening. 
So please do contact us if you can feel you can help in any way with this or any of our other incident desk cases. And here's the number once again, 081 811 8181. That's 081 811 8181. This is a copy of a letter from a murderer. It's one of several written to the police and the killer suggests it will be his last communication. He's been playing something of a game with detectives, a deadly game, almost as though the killing was incidental to him. Maybe he's unable to imagine the distress he's caused the friends and family of his victim. But with any luck tonight, you or someone else who's watching might help the community in Leeds to catch him. The greatest suffering was to an individual he apparently picked at random, Julie Dart, whose family has helped us make this reconstruction. It's Tuesday the 9th of July, and Julie spent the evening with her boyfriend, Dominic, and two members of his family. So, Dom, when's your leg getting better, then? As soon as possible, I hope. I hope so, too. I want to go dancing. Well, so do I, but I can't on this leg, can I? Well, then you shouldn't get so drunk in future, then, should you? <laughs> and it was just me that was drunk, wasn't well, it? Well, I was influenced. Hey, listen, you should take him to pictures. Oh, yeah? yeah. Um, do, you, do you fancy going to see that film, that um, Madonna film, In Bed with Madonna? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah we can get the tram down there in a couple of weeks. Oh, yeah? What are you going to go? Tram. They're introducing trams to Leeds. No, it's, yeah. not a, it's not a tram, it's a monorail. No, it's not a tram. It's a monorail. Julie, she was just a nice, pleasant, everyday 18-year-old girl. She was happy, bubbly, honest, and very, very trusting to people. She was just that sort of person. She'd go out, she liked to drink, she liked dancing. She went to the karaoke. She enjoyed it, she enjoyed singing. She couldn't sing, but she enjoyed going and joining in. Just about a month before she died, she started changing her hairstyles and trying different makeups. And just growing up, she coloured her hair and then she put it back to her own colour because I said I didn't like it, really. She didn't have any problems at all as far as we were concerned. None at all. She was just happy. Go lucky, just as she always was. That evening, at about a quarter to eight, Julie left for work. Well, I'm off to work then. She told her boyfriend and her family she worked at the LGI, Leeds General Infirmary. But since Julie's death, police have discovered that was untrue. In fact, in the few weeks before she disappeared, she'd been seen regularly on the streets of Chapel Town. And she was here that Tuesday night. I was driving down Spencer Place, and just as I came to the junction of Leopold Street, I noticed the girl who used to go to school with us, Julie Dart, standing with a, a mixed-race girl. Julie, I presume, recognised me because she turned away as if embarrassed. Julie had been wearing a black skirt and mauve and black jacket when she left home. Where did she change her clothes before arriving here in Spencer Place? Then, at nine o'clock, Julie rang Dominic. Hello? Hi, oh, yeah, it's me. Hi. Listen, I'm, I'm just ringing to let you know I'm at work, and I'm going to stay at your mum's tonight because I'm working late. I probably won't be finished till half past 11. Yeah, that's all right. I'll see you tomorrow, then. Yeah, see you tomorrow. I love you. Yeah, me too. Bye. He remembered hearing music in the background and thought perhaps Julie was calling from a pub. Did you see her make that call? Then, three days later, the letter seemed to be in Julie's hand and said she'd been abducted. Help me, please. I've been kidnapped and I'm being held as a personal security until next Monday night. Please go and tell my mum straight away. Love you so much, Dominic. Mum, phone the police straight away and help me. The same day, the police received a disconcerting letter too. Although that letter was typed, it made no direct reference to Julie, but stated that a young woman had been kidnapped from the Chapel Town area. The letter demanded £140,000 from the police. It also included a threat to firebomb a large city centre store if the instructions in the letter were not complied with. West Yorkshire Police sent to the laboratory a handwritten letter and envelope which appeared to have come from a girl who claimed to have been kidnapped. The letter was signed Julie 
and I was asked to try and establish its authenticity. The police also supplied me with a large number of specimens of Julie Dart's handwriting, and I made a comparison of those with the question letter and envelope, comparing letter by letter, looking not just at the pictorial effect of the letters, but the way in which they were formed, and also uh, handwriting habits, such as the way in which uh, the envelope was addressed. In my opinion, Julie did write the letter and envelope. We set up an incident room. Obviously, we took the letters very seriously and looked into Julie's movements to, to establish when she was last seen. And then eight days later, our inquiries took us to Lincolnshire. It's Friday the 19th of July, 10 days since Julie disappeared. This is 90 miles away from Leeds on the B6403 outside Easton, near Grantham. I was travelling to work on the coach, early turn, 6 o'clock start, and I noticed this red car coming out of the track to my right, and it appeared that he didn't know which way to turn. And then as the coach got to very near to him, he decided to reverse back uh, into the slipway. Two hours later, a local farmer visited his fields. We were about to move some cattle from the dairy farm down to some pastures, and we found what was thought to be a package of litter. It was a sheet bound up with a bluey-green rope, which later on proved to be a body. In the days and weeks that followed, Leeds police received five further letters. The killer was tantalising the detectives, threatening to take a further hostage and demanding money. He set up rendezvous, but he never kept to his arrangements. The Forensic Science Service has maintained for many years, in fact since the 1930s, a large collection of type styles from thousands of different machines. On comparing uh, the question types with, with specimens, I found that it corresponded most closely with the specimens from Olivetti manual type bar typewriters. There is quite a lot of damage to the typeface itself. The figure zero has a large portion missing at the bottom left-hand side. The capital letter P has the top serif missing, which can be seen best if we compare it with an undamaged specimen. And also, a portion is missing out of the very middle of the lowercase f. The style of the type and the damage that's occurred to it uh, does suggest for the typewriter that's 20 or 30 years old. Bob Taylor, whoever your man is, he travels a fair bit because the six letters that you had were posted uh, all around the country, all around central and northern England, as you can see from the map here. One of those letters on the envelope, perhaps he gave you a clue he hadn't intended to give. That's right. On the second letter posted in Leeds, there was an indentation on the envelope. It was posted on the 20th or the 21st of July. The indentation reads, Mavis, will not be in on Tuesday, Phil. Someone may recognise the handwriting or may know of a Mavis and a Phil. So was Mavis a cleaner, a secretary, a colleague? Uh, who was it who wouldn't be in on Tuesday? Whose handwriting is that? And whose typewriter is it? Very distinctive, and maybe anybody who's got an old Olivetti uh, should check it, because it needn't be his own. He might have access to somebody else's. That's right. As you've seen, the zero and the F have distinct gaps in them. And uh, it may be someone else's typewriter. It is an old typewriter. I would ask anyone with a typewriter at home or work to check it because, of course, he hand-wrote some of the letters to you, suggesting he didn't always have a typewriter with him. Julie was held somewhere from the Tuesday she was kidnapped, the 9th of July, until perhaps the, the, the weekend. And obviously, you want to know anybody's, of anyone who's got suspicions or anyone who saw her body being dunked, dumped on Friday the 19th of July. But you also need to find out about the sheet in which her body was wrapped, which is old, distinctive, and had a laundry mark on it. That's right. The laundry tag, which was held by zinc staples, bore the letters MA143. We know that the staples and the laundry tag were made between 1945 and 1960 by Braithwaite's of Kendal in Cumbria. We'd like to contact customers of those as they're no longer in business who may be able to tell us what that mark means. Or someone who's lost uh, a sheet that they were keeping perhaps as a spare sheet that they'd had for many years. That may well be the case. Now, this 
device here is part of an elaborate plot that he had to, to extort money and he's put this together himself but the most interesting thing about it perhaps is that the container itself which is uh, sort of, he's painted the inside of it has been made from uh, an aquarium or, or goldfish food container that's right it's an aquarium brand fish food container maybe he's got uh, access to an aquarium maybe he picked it up from a rubbish dump one doesn't know he's obviously got some electrical uh, experience he wired this up himself he's got some technical knowledge he has got some technical knowledge yes any other indications of that well in the letters it does refer to the uh, microns the thickness of the plastic and also PIR detector which is passive infrared now you've got quite a profile of him you've been speaking to forensic psychologists and working through this yourself what can you tell us about him for anybody who's got suspicions or any thoughts which is helping this to jigsaw together he appears to have a dislike for the police He's written to the Leeds City Police, and as they cease to exist as such in 1974, that may suggest he's an older person. He has low literal skills from the letters, the spelling and grammar, so he may well be self-taught. It would appear that he works alone. He has probably not killed before. Not a senior position, if he is in employment at the moment, and uh, his core aim would probably not be the murder of Julie Dart, but may well be the obtaining of the £140,000 from the police. It's extraordinary sort of blackmail to blackmail the police because normally blackmailers say don't tell the police. It's as though he's got a grudge against the police. That may well be so, yes. But of course the people paying the penalty of the whole uh, community are obviously very concerned about him and of course the individual family concerned. If you can help please ring Bob Taylor and his colleagues either here in the studio 081 811 8181 or you can call the Milgarth Police Station that's on 0532 413 022 0532 the code for Leeds 413 022 Well we seem to be getting quite a lot of calls in at the moment all of our photo call cases have had calls um, two interesting calls on William and Christopher Sheffer possibly they may be in West London or in Brighton um, we've had some calls on the two building society robbers in Devon. On the reconstructions, quite a lot of calls on the murder of seven-year-old Angela Flaherty. We're checking those out now. Some of those are, are suggesting names. And there may be somebody in the building trade called Mick Reed. Um, a caller suggested that he should call in and eliminate himself from uh, inquiries. He lives in the Hayes or Ryslip area, so Mick Reed, please do ring in if you would. Um, and there are plenty more things, but we'll, we'll leave it at that for the moment and perhaps um, come back with more progress reports at 11.25. Uh, the lines here are going to remain open now till midnight, and you can find all the numbers for the police on CFAX. That's page 618. Finally, just before we go, uh, on a slightly less serious note, police in Sussex are looking for Mildred. She's age 40, she's quite distinctive, she has in fact had major bodywork repairs. Her damaged left side shell has been patched up with fibreglass. She's one of 32 tortoises stolen from an animal sanctuary near Lewis. If you've seen her, please do call. And incidentally, you may not know it, it's now illegal to import tortoises into Britain. We'll be back, uh, perhaps with news of Mildred and Crime Watch update at 25 past 11. And do join us. If you can't stay up till then, don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Welcome back. 
We seem to have had a consistently good response on most of our cases tonight, with calls fairly equally split between here in the studio and the individual incident rooms around the country. We've had particularly strong calls on most of our photo call cases, but we'll start with the first of our reconstructions. Nick. Indeed. Uh, the tragedy in Huddersfield, the murder of seven-year-old Angela Flaherty, who was last seen cycling in a play area just behind her home. We reconstructed Angela's last hours and two sightings that could be of her killer. One man dressed in beige clothes was seen jumping down from Kilner Bank close to where Angela was found. And two hours later or so, another man was seen at the same place. And Peter Bottomley, you've got a number of potential um, witnesses, or, or at least names for those people. Over 100 calls have been received. I think we're 143 at the moment. I'm delighted with the response. There's been some good suggestions from people living in the Rothorpe and Dalton areas. We must trace these men. I've got to trace them to either eliminate them or implicate them. I still want the public to ring in. OK, even you were saying if they assume that someone else will share their suspicions and someone else will ring in. It's That's vital not good enough. that they have got to ring in, not leave it and hope that someone else rings in. The slightest okay. suspicion, please ring. One caller was rather distressed, uh, I gather, and wanted him or her to ring in again. She was a little bit concerned about the confidentiality. I can assure anyone who rings in that any information they've got will be dealt with with utmost confidence. All right, Peter, thank you very much. Thank you. Sue. Well, David Hatch has been monitoring results coming in from your incident desk cases. David, first of all, there was the armed robbery on the security van in Northampton at the end of July. Yes, sir. we've had 22 calls on that one, most of them giving names for the, the guys who might fit those EFITs that we showed you. None of the names duplicate, but of course it only needs one of them to be right, so we can remain optimistic. Right. Then there was the murder inquiry in South East London involving a fire at a disused warehouse. Yes, over 80 calls there, all sorts of suggestions about that label Fenton, Fento, Gen Hos, whatever. We've had some of the, the suggestions we were already aware of, but we can follow the others up. We've had one or two suggesting names, again, for the artist's impression that we showed. If you know who that is, please call us. That's the real point of the appeal. Right. Who is this man? That's the victim of the fire. Um, thirdly, there was the hijack of the manager of a Thomas Cook bureau de change. Looking, are you looking for two men? Yes, we've had about ten calls giving us suggestions, and well-meaning calls, about the meaning of those slang words that were used, cushy and ton up. We don't need to know that. What we want to know is who are these guys who we show the e-fits of. Um, we've had a late flurry of activity on that one with a few names coming in. So that, again, could be promising. Right, and then there was the case where you were looking for a man who abducted and raped an 11-year-old girl from Corn in Leicester. Any news on that? Yes, dreadful case. 50 calls. We've had a couple of suggestions about names. One lady has called saying she's reported a man who fits that artist's impression and he abducted a young boy a few years back. So that's one that may well turn out to be promising. If you can help, please call us. Thanks. Nick. Another hunt in Yorkshire for the murderer of Julie Dart. Julie was abducted from the streets of Leeds at the beginning of July. Ten days later, she was found dead, 90 miles away in Lincolnshire. A killer has been writing letters to the police, and we showed extracts from them in the hope that Scramwatch viewers might recognise some of the distinctive features, in particular some of the damaged or uh, rather curious typeface. And actually, you've got one or two quite interesting calls about the possible typewriter. We know it's a, well, I'm pretty sure it was a 20-year-old Olivetti. That's right, yes. One caller did ring in. Um, obviously had some information to give us which sounded interesting but uh, someone came into the room and had to ring off. I'd like that person to get back in touch. OK. One of the letters that was addressed, you had that curious indentation that uh, scientists managed to reveal which said, Mavis will not be in Tuesday. Phil. Now, the last time I saw you, you'd only got one call on that, which is surprising. Well, I've had another call now, uh, so we've had two, but there must be more than two Mil Phil and Mavises who are in a work situation in the country. I'd like more Mavises to ring in who know we're Phil at work. OK, even, I mean, you've just got to eliminate all the Mavis Phil connections, wherever they are, however many. The laundry mark, MA143, a couple of quite uh, interesting calls on that. Yes, we've had some calls from servicemen who suggest that the letters and figures are part of the serviceman's own number that he had in the services. We'd like more calls on that. It sounds an interesting line of inquiry. And I know you just had a hunch that maybe the murderer himself called into Crime Watch. Yes, that's right. Somebody did ring up. They wanted to speak to me uh, and rang off. Um, didn't give the name. It was a, an unusual call. Well, let's hope uh, he calls in again and we get a lot more calls to help to catch him. So, Bob, thank you very much. Sue. Well, our next case was the baffling murder of Penny Bell from Denham in Buckinghamshire. 
Earlier this evening, we revealed evidence from a new witness who'd been walking her dog in Black Park near Ivor on the morning of Penny's death. She saw a man getting out of a bronze or brown coloured car and into a blue Jaguar XJS, which was just five minutes' drive from where Penny lived. Mr Edwards, have you had any calls on that particular sighting to corroborate it? <clears throat> no, as yet we've heard nothing about this sighting. Um, if you bear in mind, the description was of a man aged about 48, 5 foot 10, medium build, light shirt and dark trousers. We desperately need to hear from anybody who can confirm that sighting. Right, remember it was around 10 o'clock <clears throat> or just before 10 on Thursday the 6th of June. Yes. Secondly, there was a lorry driver who saw them about half past ten, twenty past ten, in Greenford Road. Mm. He saw a blue Jaguar with a female passenger, a female driver and a male passenger having some kind of struggle over the steering wheel. Mm. Yes. He did notice, which we weren't able to show before, a gold bracelet on the man's wrist. That's right. Because you haven't had many calls on this sighting. No, we've had nothing on that at all, and it is important that we hear from people who can firm up that sighting for us, if possible. You, you're sure, aren't you, that there must be many more people who did see something, perhaps without realising it, on that Thursday morning? Yes. The murder took place, we're certain, in that busy car park at a busy time of day when lots of people were using the area. Somebody must have seen something and we desperately need them to come forward and tell us about it. And the extraordinary thing is it was all within the space of less than an hour. She left home at about 9.40 and the car was seen in the car park at around 10.30. Yes. So if you did see anything... On the 6th of June, please do give us a ring. And finally, many thanks to Mick Reed for ringing in and giving us the information that he did. Nick. Well, as Sue said, uh, photo call is the area that tends to get the most calls, and you've had uh, a lot of them, I know. Mm -hmm. What about William and uh, Christopher Schaefer, the, the two chaps wanted in America? Yes. Um, about uh, 25 calls, so we've had a reasonable response, and there's one that the officers are particularly keen on, so let's hope that is the one that makes the difference. There was nine tonnes of cannabis involved in that uh, American inquiry. The next case was an altogether smaller... Uh, uh, an odd couple, one much mm -hmm. older than uh, the colleague, who... who uh, we think we're involved in two robberies, one in Exeter, one in Brighton. That's right. Um, big age gap there, so that might make the difference to actually identify them. We haven't had an enormous response, but there's one particular from a solicitor that the officers are looking into, so again, fingers crossed. Robert uh, Trevelyan wanted in connection with an inquiry into some sexual attack. Enormous. As you can see, I've got some of them here. Enormous response, and the officers are, are absolutely delighted. We've got sightings of him very recently all over the place. What we need to know is where he is now. Is he now? Is he working for you? Is he drinking with you? Are you putting him up in a hostel somewhere? Please ring us tonight. Very quickly, the stolen PCs from Hemel Hempstead. That's uh, personal computers, not police officers. <laughs> yes. Um, the officers are, are absolutely delighted. They've had four different calls giving the same names and the same addresses. So, as we speak, I'm sure these addresses are being visited and these men traced. Thank you, Jackie. Well, that's it for tonight. Thank you to everyone who's called to help. If you still have information to give, the lines here are open for another 20 minutes or so, or you can contact the investigating officers direct, and those numbers will be on your screen in just a moment. Meanwhile, till next month, good night. Good night. Yeah.